Discussing world-changing ideas through real conversations. Exploring the potential of technology to solve the most critical challenges facing business, people and the planet. Coming up... The executives today are very savvy. They understand what service we're providing, what benefit we're providing. I think that it's been challenging so far for them to think of us as a service provider versus a competitor. These carriers like to do things themselves. They like to maintain that control. And it's really at that executive level that we see those conversations shift. This is the Real Conversations podcast by Nokia. Here is Michael Hainsworth. Mike Alt has seen the evolution of the wireless world where telecom companies no longer see value in owning and operating the infrastructure. That's where Extinet comes in, a neutral hub company that is essentially a digital real estate company serving mobile network operators and enterprise customers with everything from the towers to the equipment necessary to leverage 5G's campus capability. And as the senior VP for planning and engineering at the neutral host tells me, 5G has changed the economics of the industry. It's a shared economic situation, to your point. You know, when carriers in the past, they would um, they would own and operate the entire infrastructure, which means that they they were they bore they they had the burden of the financial burden as well as the operational burden. And so companies like us come in and we build that same infrastructure but we share those economics across multiple tenants uh, with the intent of not only providing you know a, a better economic solution but also as as good a service levels uh same operational support uh takes a lot of that of that operational burden off of the carriers as well as obviously you know an economic be- uh, benefit to them so what do you see as the most prominent use cases in multi-domain neutral hosting uh, the two that obviously come to mind the, or the, that rise to the top, the first one is outdoor small cell solutions. Um, we provide pole as well as fiber. It could be pole, fiber, or turnkey to where a carrier would provide their equipment, uh, their small cell equipment on our pole. We interconnect it with fiber if that's what they, if that's, if that's what they, they re- require. Uh, and then they operate the network uh, as a as a small cell network, no different than they would if they own that pole infrastructure as an example. And then the second one is the indoor solutions, uh, DAS solutions, or or um, what's called distributed RAN solutions indoors. Uh, those are those tend to be big stadiums. Uh, AT and T Stadium is an example of what we have. Uh, the MGM portfolio that's a that's a contract that we have that we provided a combination of DAS and and distributed RAN or DRAN solutions uh, that the carriers attach to, and then they serve their customers inside, uh, their wireless customers inside going through uh, some or all of our network. Some of my favorite use cases for your world involves things like esports, where you've got an arena, you've got a lot of people with a lot of need for connectivity, and you can roll in, make it all available, and then when the event is over, exit uh, or i suppose as well just build that in on a permanent basis like at&t arena for example correct yeah uh, most of the applications we have are permanent applications now to your point they usually have different configurations uh and an arena for or a stadium for example at&t stadium has one configuration has all the components that it stays in there permanently one of the configurations is for a football game and then one of them is for a concert so during a football game, you don't want to cover the field. And during a concert, you do want to cover the field, as an example. Um, so those those applications you mentioned where so they have a, a specific event, uh, the, sometimes we have to tune or modify that, mo- that system in order to accommodate that particular configuration. Uh, it doesn't involve taking in or, ta- or, you know, installing or deinstalling equipment. It's more about configurations, making some changes, software, hardware, in order to meet that requirement. Right. Every use case has a different need of a network that's capable of not just high capacity and high speed, but also low latency. Sometimes you only need two out of the three. Correct. That's true. So what are the main challenges in your business model as the owner of the digital infrastructure? Is it onboarding the CSPs? Is it regulation acquiring new tenants? It's a combination of all of them. We always say that we have ultimately, especially on the indoor um, neutral host solutions, we have two real customers. We have the venue customer 
and we have the carrier customer. We say that from the perspective of the venue, first of all, might provide, might require their own service that we offer to them, uh, as well as the wireless service. But then also the venues, they're very concerned about aesthetics. And so it's, it's a, it's a bit of a push pull of in order to get the best wireless network solution for the MNOs, you would have to put assets in places that the venues don't want them to put. They, you know, they don't want them seen. They don't want them noticed. Um, it, the, the biggest conversations that we always have are about the luxury suites. You know, the, the, the venues want that. They want those luxury seats to be rock solid as to the MNOs. The venues, however, don't want to see a single piece of equipment. So that's, that's the biggest struggle is getting, coming to that compromise between what is truly ideal from an operational or an engineering perspective versus what is aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, I can imagine it's so much easier to turn a cell tower into a palm tree than it is to turn a small cell box that hangs on a wall into something that people don't notice. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> if we put a palm tree in, the, in, a, in a building, I think someone would notice that and probably not want that. So. <laughs> I, I, I'm fascinated by your world because I have some experience with it in Toronto, Canada, where the transit system has a third party that built in the infrastructure so that you could use your smartphone on the platform, on the train, what have you. But the three primary carriers in the city all said they wanted nothing to do with it because they didn't build it. They aren't the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. What kind of struggle and challenge do you face when it comes to CSP still having that old school thinking of we have to own everything? How do you overcome that hurdle? It's, it's a challenge. There's no doubt. Now, things have changed over the course of the last few years where when you talk about mark, capital markets, you talk about expense dollars, you talk about dollars per bit that are necessary to, to be delivered. Um, carriers in the past who might have been a little bit more, they're, they're heavy on the capital side or they have capital available. Um, now they don't. Uh, or likewise, they, they, they want to defer some of that spend over to the expense side so they can stretch their capital. So one of the challenges that, that has kind of taken a turn within the market itself is when car carriers have been able to have, have come to relinquish that control for the sake of economic benefit. Um, for, you know, for lack of a better word, if, if, when the engineers were looking for the optimal solution, it was some of their business managers that came in and said, we really need just good enough. And, and good enough might require, you know, that we don't own the, the network from end to end uh, or that we don't supply a particular service level that, that, you know, maybe you would, if you owned your own network. So it, it's, it's always a struggle, especially when you have three different carriers who have three different positions that they want to take in these systems. Um, so again, reaching that compromise can be challenging. Uh, but, but in many cases, the market itself is driving that compromise. It, it's, it's the, the market's understanding that, Hey, we do need to stretch those dollars. We do need to, to, the, the dollar per uh, or the bits per dollar needs to be maximized. Ne you know, that we have to we have to deliver as much as we can with as little spend as we as possible. You say things have changed. How has the business model changed? Well, for starters, there's more about the service to the venue itself. As an example, We're talking indoor now, mm. there are more applications that we have. You know, the way we look at our our assets and business. Um, we look at that fiber asset as connecting I don't cares to I don't cares. We, we, we want to deploy that fiber for the sake of carrying mobile traffic or enterprise traffic or venue traffic itself in some cases. And so how the business model has changed is instead of just looking for a network solution that is really very carrier centric or MNO centric, we're now looking at applications that, yeah, we've laid that, that fiber that will serve the carrier's needs, but then also a small, you know, a small little modification to it. And, and lo and behold, it serves an enterprise solution or it, you build a little bit more and now it becomes a ring architecture. Uh, so that's how that's changed to where we are. We are looking at more revenue streams and revenue opportunities to maximize that asset than we were in the past where it was just very carrier centric. 
You've used the term MNO quite a bit, the, the mobile network operator. Is that sort of interchangeable with mobile virtual network operator? Because I could see that your business model is evolving. It's not just you're working with the telecommunications companies themselves, but companies that previously you would never have expected had an interest in being a mobile provider now are. Very true. Uh, we are speaking with some, the M MVNOs that we're talking to mostly are, say, cable companies who have who have existing MVNO agreements with, say, a, a traditional Verizon or somebody, and and they're looking for to build their own network. Dish Network is the same situation. You know, they're using that that existing mobile uh, mobile operators equipment or, or infrastructure to serve their customers, so they could build a customer base that they would ultimately serve themselves with their own network assets. And so we are talking to MVNOs as well. To your point, who are interested in hey, you know, we might have a better economic advantage by going with an Exonet than we would uh, go staying with the MNO for a long period of time or, or some sort of mix between the two where it's preferred that it's it rides on, on our network being, whether it be Exonet or whether it be the MBNO's network itself until it can't and it has to get, it gets outside of its range and then it, it roams over to that, that same MNO part that it has today. We recently had a conversation with the NTCA's uh, Shirley Bloomfield uh, about how these mom and pop companies that provide fiber into rural areas now have an opportunity to become their own MVNO. True. Uh, some of the, it's it's funny. Some of the customers that we have today are rural utilities. Uh, they have, in some cases, they built their own fiber. Uh, in many cases, almost all cases, they have their own spectrum. And so they are starting to utilize their assets um, using infrastructure that we provide or services that we provide to be a data provider for, you know, it's a rural customer who, who they're getting, they're providing electricity to. They really don't have too many data options. The size of cable companies can stretch out that far. So now they're using our infrastructure or a combination of ours and theirs to add data service to the to the same customers that they supply power to. Let's talk about monetizing your fiber assets specifically through ecosystems. You know, cloud companies have always been looking for better connectivity solutions. They have a need today to connect better to the cloud, particularly AI compute. Uh, we talk about augmented reality uh, and offloading the heavy lifting of the com uh, computations necessary to make that possible to the cloud. What are your thoughts on, on the ecosystems and the cloud companies that are monetizing assets? Sure. So they, you're, to your point, a lot of the services that they usually would do on more of a desktop based application are now becoming cloud services. Um, they, and uh, uh, Oracle is a good example. Oracle has shifted its entire business such that it, we're not talking about Oracle on local servers. We're talking about Oracle as a service on their own cloud solutions. Well, when they made that shift, what they didn't really account for at the time was the, the total amount of payload that they'd have to be supporting into their own cloud solutions in order to provide the service. And so now we're having conversations with, uh, with these kinds of companies to build very purpose-built networks, very purpose-built uh, optical networks that are designed not only for high capacity, but for low latency. It technically started with some of the trading companies in the trading world, if you can shave off nanoseconds, you've got a competitive edge. And so these networks had to be built with with the with the minimum distance in mind, the you know the minimum latency in mind. Now, from the cloud providers, same situation. It's not only not only latency, but it's also massive bandwidths that that need to be, need to address their needs and not not be built as a me too. Well, yeah, you can ride this network. It's no. This network has to be optimized for my specific need. What role does AI play in, in the evolution of your world as, as we see more compute move to the edge of the network for that technology? So we we have started to, uh, there, there's been requests recently to put more edge-based hardware into the same hub locations that used to house just wireless telecommunications equipment. Um, as we move those the tour, you know, into mobile edge computing as we move things further and further out into to the edge of the system, 
now those locations, they, they have to be, the, uh, the equipment has to be located, co-located, I'm sorry, with the actual telecommunications equipment itself. So it's all about decreasing the distance from the server to the user. And so we're starting to see, we don't just see rooms that have telecommunications equipment anymore. We see server racks that have, you know, this, this server rack is for Netflix and this server rack is for MSN or, or, or whomever that provider may be. So we're really changing more from a, from a, um, from a real estate perspective where we have to account for that additional technical requirements within the real estate that we provide. After this podcast, learn more about this and other insightful topics by going to nokia.com slash thought dash leadership. There you'll find additional information linked to today's podcast. So you have significant deployments. A lot of focus on 5G is on that millimeter wave band, that that indoor high speed, low latency capability. Tell me about the evolution of your business and the needs of 5G and, and the fact that it's not just a case of sticking a, another box on a tower outside a building, you're going to want to wire up these campuses directly. Sure. Uh, it's, it almost falls in the same category of being closer to the user as well as being closer to as many users as you can get. Uh, the need for 5G for, or for millimeter wave solutions, obviously massive broadbands that propagate in very short distances you know, really for what's called nomadic traffic, people who are walking, looking at their phones, you know, or using their phones while they're, while they're walking or they're, they're, they're maybe stationary for a while, stay on a street corner, waiting for the light to turn, you know, they, they do their own interactions, then they move on to the next location. Um, all of those transactions, all that data requirement, it drives for, for significant broadband usage. Our needs. And so therefore the millimeter wave solutions are being deployed on small cells for the sake of capturing that specific nomadic traffic. In addition to future applications, autonomous vehicles are very, very heavy on data requirements. And so that, that constant connectivity is going to be critical. I just, I just, uh, attended a, a conference just a few weeks ago about, um, autonomous vehicles. And even before that, I had, I or before I attended that, I had no idea exactly how much data is going to be necessary in order to make this a reality. And we're not just talking about the vehicle to vehicle communication, but we're talking about vehicle to the rest of the world communication. Um, so that, that those 5G or those millimeter wave deployments are critical in order to provide that band, that massive bandwidth in that short distance, such that when that vehicle goes from, you know, down the block, it has constant communication, constant bandwidth that it's using in order to really drive the car safely and, and avoid any kind of accidents. Yeah, I had a fascinating conversation with the CTO of Intel a little while back, and it was his assertion that uh, autonomous vehicles will consume two terabytes of data every single day. It was just a fascinating look at what's expected in the not too distant future, but also in the not too distant future, uh, back to the, 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 the millimeter wave devices, I'm thinking about smart buildings and uh, IOT specifically. What kind of evolution are you seeing in your industry as companies recognize that 5G provides a tremendous opportunity to basically quantify every aspect of our lives? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it, we're 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 getting we're not inching towards a connected world. We're racing towards a connected world right now. The most obvious application that we see in that regard is it is very clear what at least T-Mobile and Verizon are doing, competing head to head with a cable provider for data services. It, it, it you no longer have to get your data just from you know a cable coming in or even an optical link coming in. They're using that fixed wireless aspect from, from millimeter wave de deployments to provide data solutions for the home. That's just one example of where, you know, providing uh, a, a broadband solution is well beyond just mobility. It's well beyond just what we talked about from a, like a, a vehicle perspective. It is providing connectivity in all facets of life. Um, which we're all now very accustomed to there's even when people go on vacation they're 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 still 
they're not looking. Most people are not looking to be disconnected. Unfortunately, they probably should be. I know I'm. I'm. I would love to be disconnected when I'm on vacation. I never am, and and when I am disconnected on vacation. I feel very anxious about it. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. I, I think I have maybe five or six USB-based chargers in my carry-on luggage alone. <laughs> I, I can't imagine what the guys going through with the the scanners, the x-ray machines must be thinking it's in that bag. <laughs> uh, but what would you like a telecom executive to leave with after listening to this conversation about the evolution of neutral hosts? The executives today are very savvy on what our business is. Um, they understand what service we're providing, what benefit we're providing. I think that it's been challenging so far for them to think of us as a service provider versus a competitor. Um, oftentimes to your, to the point we were talking about before, these carriers like to do things themselves. They like to maintain that control. And it's really at that executive level that we see those conversations shift. At the local levels, we see you know, the engineers, I'm an engineer. I've been an engineer for going on 30 years now. Um, I understand the need to have that level of control and make sure that I can meet those requirements. And so at the local level, it's very much, you know, I, I want to make sure that I'm doing what, what I'm supposed to do for my customer. At the executive level, it's much more of, I want to balance what I'm doing for my customer with what I can afford. And so I, I'd like those telecommunication executives to really have those conversations with us. We're, we are well more than just a, well, we'll put you on a pole and we'll charge you money. You know, there's a lot of services that we can offer. There are solutions we can offer. Private LTE is the perfect example of, of something we can provide the service at the same level that the MNO can possibly with an, with a shared economic situation, right? So that's what I want them to, to understand. If, if I was talking to one today, I would, I would want them to understand that we're more than just a real estate company. We are a service provider that can, that they can benefit from having still levels of service that they expect at shared economics that are better for them. Building a future that's productive, sustainable, and inclusive in a world that acts together. Discover how by visiting nokia.com slash thought leadership.